Well, if you ever want a good laugh, I suggest you go to the internet and search for resume bloopers. Amazing mistakes are made by very professional, serious people who are looking for career advancement. I just threw a couple up on the screen for you to look at this morning with me as people apply for jobs and fill out their resume. Here are some things that they say. Skills, strong work ethic, attention to detail, team player, self-motivated, attention to detail. So, okay. This person said, my duties include cleaning restrooms and seating customers. It's like, oh. <laughs> Something just, yeah. Reread that. This candidate explained an arrest by stating, we stole a pig, but it was really a small pig. <laughs> Why would you put that, anyway. Just one letter often makes a difference, you know. When you proofread yourself, you have to really be careful. One letter makes a difference. This guy said, consistently tanked as top sales producer for new accounts. Just one letter different was all he needed there. For some reason, this person said, I am able to say the ABCs backwards in under five seconds. Like, that's going to get you points. I mean... Uh, can anybody here say the ABC is backwards? I mean, that's uh, pretty, it is kind of an interesting, I, I can't say them frontwards in five seconds, I'm pretty sure. This person received a plague for the salesperson of the year award. One, again, one little letter, just come on, man, one letter. I am a perfectionist and rarely, if, if ever, forget details. <laughs> I love that one. And this guy says, My languages, I speak English and spinach. It's, it's just a little bit more. And this guy says, uh, my objective, so one of the main things for me as, is as the movie Jerry Maguire puts it, show me the money. I mean, like, if you're the employer, you'd like to, uh, that's a sure way to get the job is to just say, the bottom line, give me the money. You guys, how would you write a resume for God? Professor Cottrell, in his book, you know, The Faith Once Delivered, has three sections on God. Just three, three sections just on God. And you wonder, how can you write like 75 pages on God? But when you start working at it, you realize the subject is way bigger than 75 pages, right? He wrote the existence of God, the nature of God, and the work of God, and he broke it down like that. If I had to choose just one psalm in our Summer of the Psalms series, uh, to give the resume for God, I, if I had to, I would choose Psalm 145. Uh, a reporter interviewed a 104-year-old woman, and he asked her, what is the best thing about being 104 years old? And she said, no peer pressure. Yeah, right. No peer. That's exactly right. Guess what? God has no peers. That's what we learn from Psalm 145. If you haven't learned it through the 144 Psalms leading up to it, this one will show it to you. Charles Spurgeon was 21 years old when he wrote these words. Would you lose your sorrows? Would you drown your cares? Then go and plunge yourself into the study of God. Be lost in his immensity, and you shall come forth from your chair refreshed and invigorated. Some of you have probably heard this rendition uh, by DS, Dr. D.S. Uh, uh, S.M. Lockridge, who wrote a nine-paragraph description of God. Every paragraph was better than the one before. It's just outstanding. At the very end, he writes these words, Well... After nine paragraphs, well, I wish I could describe him to you, but he is indescribable. Yes, he's incomprehensible, he's invincible, he's irresistible. I'm coming to tell you that heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explain him. Well, in Psalm 145, David gives it a try. He tries to explain God. And it's a really cool song. This is one of eight songs, psalms, if you will, that 
use an acrostic to systematically work through the subject. So he takes the Hebrew alphabet and he begins each line like we would with A, B, C. He begins each line like that, systematically going through this acrostic. So on your info page, I put uh, the alphabet and as we work through this, I would just love for you to use your own creativity and as the Holy Spirit guides you this morning, write down one, a one word description that begins with that letter that describes God. And it's just a good exercise, a good devotional. I'm sorry, say again, Joe. I got six words. Oh, congratulations. You got 20 more to go, buddy. Well, you can do it right now. I give you permission. I give you permission to do two things at once. Girls can do that. Guys, you don't have a chance. But girls can do that. I, I know how that works. But just go for it if you can. And just try to give it an attribute for God. And it's a fun little exercise. And maybe if you sit with somebody else, I'd sure like to know what you're going to do when you get to X. But, you know, tell, tell me how you're going to handle that. I just picked out four words from Psalm 145 that that's jump out at me. Now, I'm sure as you read it, probably some other words would jump out to you. I give you that. That's cool. But I, I just see these four words that begin with G, so you shouldn't have any problem with the letter G. But in verse 3, there's greatness. In verse 7, there's goodness. In verse 8, there's gracious. And verse 5, and also verse 12, the, the word glorious. And so those are the four words I'm going to use today to work my way through this psalm. But I will freely let you go another route on that because there's a whole bunch of cool words in there that describe God. See if you can pick out these four words. I read through Psalm 145. It'd be good if you had your Bible open in your version. Open up your phone because it's just uh, overpowering this description. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you. Lord, your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people might know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. <clears throat> Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Well, that's a pretty good start on a resume for God. And as we look at that, I would like you to kind of review with me from last week, Psalm 121. Did you notice, if you have your Bible open, did you notice the Lord, every letter is capitalized? Capital L, capital O, capital R capital D. Again, that's referring to the covenant-keeping God who is faithful. Even if we're faithless, he's faithful. Well, let's work through this. 
there's a lot here. I won't do a, an adequate job on God's resume, but I'll give it a shot. But there's a lot more to be said than I can say. First, greatness. His greatness no one can fathom. Verse 3. Uh, I, I would say the word great might be one of the most overused words in the English language, maybe. We say great hair, great car, great pizza, great movie. Maybe some of you heard that the great truths, great truths for a senior citizen. And just throw this in here. Great truths. There's four stages of life for a senior citizen. You believe in Santa Claus. You don't believe in Santa Claus. You are Santa Claus. You look like Santa Claus. <laughs> the great truths, the great truths for a senior citizen. So great is used a lot in our language. But in this text, it has something to do with being magnificent, splendid, exceedingly huge. Who do you consider great? Well, if you're watching the Olympics, I missed it. I had to see it on replay, but Sonny Lee won the Olympic gold medal in women's gymnastics. Wasn't expected to. That's great. She's great. Uh, my father-in-law was one of 90,000 U.S. soldiers in a convoy going to England in World War II. Can you imagine the enormity of that job? Feeding, clothing, equipping, transporting, keeping track of 90,000 soldiers in a convoy? That's great. That's exceedingly huge. Here's another one. Uh, the Mars rovers were launched in 2003. They landed on Mars 2004. The first rover named Spirit functioned properly until 2010. The second rover named Opportunity functioned on another planet until 2019. I mean, what an engineering marvel that is. That's, that's great. But God's greatness is is better and deeper because it's more than we can fathom. That's what David says. We can fathom some of those accomplishments that I mentioned. We can see it. We can get it. But God's past what we can think. In Psalm, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 40, verse 26, he knows every star by name. In Psalm 50, he knows every bird in the mountains. Every bird. God can measure the oceans in the hollow of his hand. That's what it says in Isaiah. Not in his hands, but just one hand. He can do it with one hand in case you're wondering. People are like grasshoppers to him. The heavens are a tent to him. If you have your Bible open or your phone open to Psalm 145, I would just challenge you to read through it with me and see how many times you can see the word all. The Lord is over all. It's in there a lot. And it's pretty amazing. You can might equal all with everything or every one and just throw all those together. But I, I think you're going to find more than 15 times that word's in there. Pretty crazy. One generation will commend your works to another, the scriptures say. They will tell of your mighty acts. And so how do kids learn about God? Uh, they learn it from their parents. James Coffin Kaufman uh, wrote a commentary on this text. It's in our church library. Uh, he said his mother read the entire Bible to him before he was old enough to attend school. And he began to think about the God of creation and the God who could flood the whole earth and then put the rainbow in the sky. And the God who could cause ten plagues to come on the country of Egypt. And the God who could wipe out an army of 185,000 soldiers. He could just wipe them out. That's when he began to learn about the greatness of God. So our, our faith is feeble because we lose track of the greatness of God. So when you open up your hands and pray, 
It's a pleasure because you are bowing before our great God who can, he knows what you're going to say before you say it and he can handle whatever it is before you think it. As the guy wrote in his nine paragraphs, I'd like to describe the greatness of God, but he's indescribable. <laughs> live, with, live with that. Then the second G word is the word goodness. I will celebrate your abundant goodness. Uh, greatness deals with God's abilities, but goodness deals with his, uh, with his heart, the way he acts, how he does things. The first time we encounter the goodness of God is in the creation account. We, God saw what he made and he said is very good. And if you stick with that, we say good, it means proper, pleasing, as it should be. And, and David tells us God possesses abundant goodness. That's what he says in the middle of verse 7. And again in verse 9, the Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. And in verse 17, it's repeated. And the point is, he's flawless. You can't point to him and say, aha, I found one slight blemish in the way he operates. Nope, he's good. And again, the word all or every is used in this psalm to talk about his completeness. For just a simple, uh, just a sample, uh, verse 9 the Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all. At the end of verse 13, all God's words are faithful. All his works kind. But, but don't stop there. Verse 14, the Lord is holding up all who are falling. He's raising up all who are knocked down. At the end of verse 16, God's hand satisfies the desire of every or all living things. Don't stop there. Verse 18, he tells us the Lord himself is near to all who call on his name. And then the, the caboose at the end of the train, verse 21, all flesh are to bless his holy name forever and ever. It's, it's just complete, not lacking. You've heard people from this stage say, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. It comes from right here. In Psalm 145, all, all. I love it that you're digging in there with me. I can see you reading and thinking. And I just encourage you to keep your Bible open and read because I won't cover it all. It's impossible. God's goodness covers all times, all people, all creation. And no matter how far back you travel in time or how far forward you go in time, he will be there covering it all. That's where you'll find his goodness, always. Let's move on to the third G word. It's found in verse 8. He is gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is, he has compassion on all he has made. Gracious is really a cool word. As I, as I looked at it again, it means to stoop in kindness to an inferior. It's such a cool picture of what God does for us. He, he bows down, he slows down to take care of us. God has the power to squish you like a bug on a windshield. Yet he stoops in kindness to protect you. We see this in a desperate, rejected woman named Hagar. Who in the book of Genesis, in the connection with the Abraham story with was rejected and the God who sees came out of nowhere and a servant girl seemingly unimportant in the middle of the desert not part of the family anymore just totally rejected yet the gracious God of heaven and earth stooped to see her and provide for her wow that's what he'll do for you God likes you. I, I, I just want you to know God likes you. He knows every star, every bird, and he knows you, and he likes you. And that might be a revelation to you. You might think that he, he's against you, that, that he's lined up all these things to fight against you, and that 
that uh, he's judging you and he's waiting for you to mess up so he can zap you. No, he stoops in kindness to you. That's why the songwriter in verse 7 says, They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Now, uh, today I'm happy that I'm awake and that I am walking because I just finished a week. Another epic week is dorm dad at junior week at Mountain View Christian Camp. And the job description for a dorm dad is long. It's a, I, I make beds and find lost socks and pairs of underwear and say, hold, hold it up and say, whose is this? And uh, I mend wounds and uh, I fix flashlights and I definitely am a referee when it comes to boxing matches that take place sporadically during the day. Um, I told stories. I played the role of the tooth fairy this week. Uh, I, I was uh, the target Unarmed, I might say, the unarmed target in a pillow fight. Uh, the dorm dad at camp doesn't push for daily showers. That's a, that's a pipe dream. You don't push for daily showers. You're just hoping the kid will change his clothes once during these next five days. And no, I'm not going to stand there and oversee that. Just, I don't want to see that shirt anymore. And there are walks in the dark to the nurse's station and to the restroom and eight hours of sleep forget about it it ain't gonna happen there are very compliant boys who miss their mom very much they're scared and there are rebellious boys who never want to see their mom again they're happy to go off at age eight age nine and take over the world one boy bragged that he could call his mom any time he wanted if he didn't like the camp program. He could call his mom any time he wanted and she'd come pick him up within an hour. After two nights, I handed him my phone and asked him to make the call. <laughs> call her now. Call her now. I'll drive halfway to take you home, but it's fine. Now listen. You might feel bad for me as an old guy being in the guy's dorm, but I volunteered for it. But don't feel bad for me because my co-dorm dad was a guy named Dave from North Syracuse who is 78 years old. Yes. And he had bypass surgery last year. And he was so helpful. And he, as a, as a guy that age, Stooped in kindness to help those kids. It was beautiful to see. That's what God does for us. Those who don't know God have this wrong impression that he's waiting for you to mess up so he can zap you. But if you just quickly, I'm just going to throw these up there real quick on the screen, but verse 13 through 20 shows how the gracious one stoops in our behalf in kindness to us. Uh, it's going to come at you fast, but here it is. He is faithful. He is loving. He upholds. He lifts. He gives. He satisfies. He is righteous. He is loving. He is near, He fulfills, He hears, He watches. He'd be a good dorm dad. <laughs> but He's a lot more than that, isn't He? This is how the gracious one stoops in kindness to you. I, I hope, I hope you can understand that today. The gracious one welcomes you. He celebrates your success. He walks with you in your disappointment. He doesn't leave you. Well, let's quickly go on to the, the last G word. And again, I know I'm barely scratching the surface on these things. But ver the number four is he's glorious. So you find that word both in verse 5 and in verse 12. The glorious splendor of his majesty. Albert Barnes 
said in his commentary, the writer labored to find language to express his thoughts. I was standing with a couple boys the other night on the hill looking as the red moon came up on I think maybe Tuesday night or Wednesday night at camp. And it was just coming above the hills and the tree line for us to see. And uh, I just asked a question or two of these boys. Man, what do you think of that? Hey guys, stop for a second. Check that out. And man, their, their words. Man, you know, how did God make it be red like that? How, how come it's like that? And man, no wonder it's so bright in our dorm room because it, the moon is shining in. It's really cool. And the word, the splendor of his glorious majesty is, uh, has to do with the word heaviness. His splendor, is, his glorious ways are so heavy. Uh, it's a load beyond our ability to carry. The Old Testament tells the story of Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember that? He's meeting with God and he sends down the word, don't let any man or any animal come up on the mountain because if they do, they will die. Well, gosh, you mean you're up on the top of the mountain, but your presence, your wonder, your splendor, your glory is so great that it affects the things on the bottom of the mountain? Wow, it's just this heaviness. And then when Moses came down from the mountain, he had been in the presence of God. They had to put a veil on his face. It's the people couldn't look. He glowed in the dark. I spoke with a guy who lives in Alaska just a couple weeks ago. A, a guy who lives in Alaska came to be at our camp. And he says uh, he grew up in western New York. And now he lives uh, two hours from Denali National Park. And uh, he can go out his driveway and look, and he can see on clear days, he can see the mountain range. And he says he walks out there, and he just, he says he and his wife are just, just quiet. <laughs> They're just overwhelmed by this majestic mountain range. And for a guy growing up in western New York who never saw anything like that, it's like, whoa, the glorious splendor of his majesty. My friend John, your friend John Walker, talks about Maui, Hawaii, as if he's describing heaven. Oh, Bowers, you got to go there. You can't believe it. It's just amazing. You got on and on he goes about that. Some of you have stood on the banks of the Snake River in, in northwest Wyoming, and you looked at the Grand Teton Mountains just standing majestically there. And there are just really no words. You just need a minute to capture the glorious splendor of His majesty. And truly, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth His handiwork. In the Bible, men fell in the presence of angels, but angels in the book of Revelation, fall in the presence of God Almighty. The glorious splendor of His majesty. Verse 13 says, His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion endures through all generations. So again, I'd, I'd like to quote uh, Mr. Lockridge in his last paragraph who said of God, He has always been and he will always be. I'm talking about he had no predecessors and he will have no successors. There was nobody before him. There'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. That's my king. Psalm 145 is a masterpiece. No wonder David, who had these thoughts in his heart as a young guy, wasn't afraid to face Goliath. He's willing to attempt great things for God because God is great. And nothing's too big for him. So how about you? My hope today in sharing this is that your view of God would expand. 
I know that some are paralyzed by the past and paralyzed by fear and you think this is where you'll always be. Nope. You might be nervous about your next steps, but I invite you to allow God to partner with you and start today. Take the first step. Launch out today in confidence. He's got you because he's great. He's good. He's gracious. And he's glorious. And he is in your corner. Oh my. He could force you to bow down before him. He could force you to serve him. He's not like that though. He doesn't need you. But the honest truth is that you need him in your corner. So David gives this fitting conclusion in verse 21. Joy, I can invite the worship team up as I, I close here. He says, My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. And that's kind of my resolve. I hope it will be your resolve as you leave here that my mouth will not curse him. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord forever and ever. I encourage you to humble yourself before our mighty King. Get with Him. Get yourself adopted into His family. It's an easy process. You repent of your past. You surrender your life to Him. You're baptized in a watery grave where you're buried and you're raised to walk a new life. You start over. He promises to empower you with His Spirit in your life. It's a great deal. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that today. You could do it now. We'd be happy to help.